Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, good to see so many people in, in person. And um, I understand there's also virtual attendees, and so welcome to them as well. Uh, I'm Rick Brown. I'm a partner and the co-head of the Fraud and Insolvency Group at HFW. Um, I've got the pleasure today of moderating the very topical topic of the Quint's care duty and the developments in that area. Um, and my panel for today, uh, first and foremost, is Helen Dodds. Um, Helen's a director of Legal UK and former global head of legal dispute resolution at Standard Chartered Bank, so well placed to give her views on this. Uh, and Geoffrey Onions, Queen's Counsel from One Essex Court. Uh, Geoffrey undertakes a wide range of complex commercial and company law disputes work with a particular focus and expertise in banking and, and finance, shareholder disputes, and international arbitration. Uh, recent cases have included the very high profile PCP Staverley and Barclays Bank, uh, where he appeared at trial for Barclays in the dispute involving uh, substantial claims arising from the alleged role of PCP and Ms. Staverley in assisting Barclays to raise some seven billion of capital. Well, welcome to you both. And um, we've got a lot to discuss uh, in the context of Quince Care. So I thought for the audience's benefit, what we'd do is we'd split this up um, into a quick re uh, recap or reminder of what the duty uh, is, the Quince Care duty, uh, a whip through of the key cases of note, uh, and then a look at the Quince Care duty in the corporate context, then separately uh, in the retail or personal banking context. And then if we've got time, we'll look at it uh, as to whether it can be excluded and finally, uh, its place in insolvencies. Um, and given all of that, I think it'd be helpful if we could wait until the end to have questions, unless you have a particularly burning one, in which case, feel free. Um, so a reminder of what the Quince Care duty is. Um, in the case of Quince Care and Barclays Bank, almost 30 years ago or so, uh, the English courts found that a bank owes a fiduciary duty to its customer, known now as the Quince Care duty. Uh, in both contract and tort to execute the customer's instructions with reasonable care and skill. And that obviously extends to refraining from making a payment pending inquiries about the bona fide nature of those instructions from a customer if it has reasonable ground for believing that the payment is an attempt to misappropriate funds from the customer. And from the case of Quinscare some 30 years ago, there was nothing really, I think, that found uh, that the bank had such a duty or had breached such a duty until the end of 2019. And then, much like London buses, several have come along at once. Uh, and Geoffrey is going to give us a quick recap of those. And we're then going to pose the question whether the banks uh, are concerned about the Quince Care duty or whether they, they should be. So, Geoffrey, if a snapshot, please. Thank you, Rick. Is that on? Yes, yes. <coughs> right, I just wanted to mention, as briefly as possible, four cases, four recent cases. Uh, the first is the Supreme Court decision in Singularis, um, a case of fraud on a company which was wholly owned by one man, uh, director, shareholder, and sole signing authority, who signed away a little matter of 200 million. And the case is important because it establishes the bank's potential liability of such customers. The bank is unable to rely upon the fraud of the controlling mind of the company, which would not be attributed to the company. Uh, and the way the duty was phrased in Singularis was that the bank would be liable if it executed an order knowing it to be dishonestly given or shutting its eyes to the obvious fact of dishonesty or acted recklessly in failing to make such inquiries as an honest and reasonable man would make. The second case I'd like to refer to um, is the Stanford decision. Uh, and this is, in fact, a case which is going on appeal to the Supreme Court. But the Court of Appeal has concluded that the bank owes the Quince Care duty to its customer and not to the creditors of the customer. And that a company that is insolvent does not suffer a loss when it pays out money to its creditors when it is trading while insolvent. And there might be a little bit of a, uh, a sting in the tail of that, because although the case did determine there was no duty owed to creditors. The case did, to some extent, turn on the particular way in which the claim was framed. And there was no attempt to make a claim for consequential loss or making the more general claim that uh, the winding up should have taken place earlier and loss was suffered by the company as a result. The third case, and this is a case which is in fact due for trial, in, I believe, February of next year, uh, a case called J.P. Morgan, which was a case of 
a massive fraud, a little matter of $875 million, where um, Morgan Chase received instructions from the Minister of Finance of Nigeria and the Accountant General of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, who were authorized signatories on an account. But there is a claim that those individuals were perpetrating a fraud. The significance of JP Morgan lies in two points. The first is JP Morgan in, attempted to establish that the terms and conditions excluded the Quince Care duty. And in a quite detailed judgment, the Court of Appeal went through a number of clauses, and all of them failed. So the Quince Care duty was not excluded in that case. But the second point that is of significance in relation to that case is the way the Court of Appeal expressed the Quince Care duty, and this is something that we might be um, looking at further later on. And what the Court of Appeal said was, in most cases, the reconciliation of the conflicting duties owed by the bank will require something more from the bank than simply deciding not to comply with a payment instruction. The bank will usually be anxious to resolve its concerns, not least so as to minimize the risk of incurring a liability to its client for any loss arising from the non-payment. And it is that which will be interesting to see how the judge deals with it when it finally comes to trial. The fourth and final case, Philip, this is in the retail banking, uh, personal banking context, um, what's known as an authorized push payment fraud, where uh, the judge at first instance, and again this case is going to appeal uh, next year, I think in March and April, where as the, the judge concluded that the quince care duty should be limited to a case of attempted misappropriation of the customer's funds by an agent of the customer, essentially confining quince care to a situation where the customer is a corporate entity or an unincorporated association, because in this case the customer was authorized to give the instruction, and the only problem was the fact that the customer itself was being defrauded. Uh, and the purpose of the quince care duty was said to be not to protect its customer from its own intentional decisions. So those are the four cases, and uh, as I say, some, to some extent, things are up in the air. We don't know what the Supreme Court is going to do in Stanford. We don't know what the Court of Appeal is going to do in Philip, and we don't know what um, the judge at first instance is going to do at J.P. Morgan. Well, that kind of wraps things up nicely then. I mean, <laughs> um, well, I suppose again, drilling down, so dealing firstly with the corporate banking context, um, and when it's clear that a duty applies, or that the, the, the Quince Care duty applies, what, what do you think the banks should be concerned about about the recent decisions? The bank in the corporate context should be concerned about the fact that banks are doing more in the way of monitoring corporate accounts. Um, I mean, particularly a number of uh, banks will have um, relationship managers with um, important clients. And the difficulty is going to be that the more you know, the more you might be under an obligation to find out. Um, and it's unclear precisely what the bank has to do in the light of JP Morgan. And that puts the bank in a difficult position, particularly in the context of the obligations that the bank has um, to report uh, to uh, the NCA in relation to uh, potential money laundering uh, and terrorist funded activities. I mean, the bank has to uh, has to provide a report when it is suspicious that something uh, of that kind is going on, uh, and the NCA will then look at the matter, hopefully speedily, uh, and will tell the bank whether the bank is entitled to make the payment or not. Uh, if the bank is told not to make the payment, then great, the bank doesn't have to make the payment and has a defense to any claim by its customer. But if the position is, as was the case in JP Morgan, that the NCA says that the payments can be made, then the bank is then on the horns of a dilemma. It has sufficient information to make a report to the NCA, but then it's been told it can make the payment, should it? The decision is thrown back on the bank, and then one has to ask the question, well, what inquiries can the bank carry out in that situation? Uh, it's probably not much good going back to the people who are instructing the payment, 
uh, not least because of the fact that there is a problem that the bank must not tip off in relation to any report that has been made to the NCA, uh, even apart from the fact that you probably wouldn't get an honest answer from those individuals. Who does the bank talk to? How does the bank carry out its inquiries? And so that, to me, is the fundamental difficulty that the banks have at the moment. Mm. So very much a, a, a kind of a legal one, but also a practical one. Uh, and, and Helen, what, so what are your thoughts on the kind of practical implications? What should the banks um, be doing? Um, well, uh, thanks, Rick, and good morning, everybody. And I'm aware that there are quite a few people here in the audience from banks, and I do hope that when we get to the discussion at the end, uh, you'll be able to contribute to this discussion. Um, I think I see the Quince Care revival as forming part of the growing expectations of politicians and the public in the UK that banks should be made responsible for third-party fraud on their customers. So looking at the sort of practical angles on the corporate side, I'm going to think about um, how can they can be aware that a, a Quince Care fraud is even going on? How can uh, effective detection be carried out? And is the risk enough to warrant the changing of banks' behaviours? Um, so in terms of becoming aware of a quince care type activity, I think there's two main buckets of case. Um, and there's one bucket which the Nigeria case would fall into, where we have a, a hugely important and high profile client with a lot of money um, in their facilities. Um, in these cases, banks will have a relationship manager for that client, and probably several. And those relationships uh, managers have the job of serving the client, and that means knowing the client, knowing uh, what the client's business is, knowing what their uh, proposed use of their banking facility is, um, and generally understanding what's going on and what should be going on in the accounts. So in a case like that, a bank has a good chance of spotting uh, a fraudulent activity. Um, one issue is that uh, relationship managers are there to serve the client, and uh, their job is largely composed of um, being very nice and obliging to the client. Um, so they may find it a bit of a leap to, um, if you like, take on the client and question the client's activities, particularly uh, when the people they might be talking to about this uh, might be the people responsible for the instructions in question. I think it's sensible to provide training to RMs about Quinn's care risk, along with all the other risks, and also the usual um, phone a friend in the legal and compliance department. However, another issue is uh, relates to payment systems. So uh, we don't live in the world of Gringotts Bank or Mary Poppins Bank, where there's a grill and there's a clerk and a ledger and a quill pen. That doesn't happen. Payments are made through payment systems uh, by people who are authorized by the customer to use those systems. Um, and this could be uh, smaller companies or, in fact, very large companies making routine uh, smaller sized payments. And the bank's not going to be aware of those payments until it, the payment's going through or even after it's gone through. So uh, what would a bank do to detect Quince Care in the case, say, of a payment clerk at the client company who's siphoning off 500 pounds here or there, they've invented uh, a recipient account in the same line of the business which looks plausible. Um, what would the bank do in those circumstances? How could they even know? In fact, I'd expect the client to pick that one up first via um, reconciliation. And then thinking about how an effective um, detection system could be introduced, there are um, systems for uh, spotting money laundering, um, politically exposed persons, sanctions, and uh, san breaches of sanctions, and so on. So um, would it be possible to have a system uh, fixed to recognize quince care type activities? If you could define sort of badges of quince care, it might be possible to do that. And then, and then what would happen? What about the duty of inquiry? So the, a red flag appears on the system and uh, warrants further inquiry. This might be done again on the system, but ultimately would be likely passed to a person. So you'd have to have the cost of enhancing the system and the cost of employing and or training a person. You'd also have a risk of false positives, which as the bankers in the room will know, happen all the time on the fraud detection system. As Jeffrey says, if the uh, bank has filed a SAR 
um, or reported to authorities, uh, they might be prohibited from raising the issue with their clients because of the tipping off risk. Um, and in fact, going back to the clients, um, you might be talking to the people who've uh, given the instructions in question, but who else could you talk to? Well, virtually nobody, um, actually, because um, banking confidentiality means, for example, you wouldn't be able necessarily to speak to shareholders who are not on the mandate. Um, so the bank is rather stuck. Um, I think really the bottom line for banks is the bottom line. It's a cost-benefit analysis. What is the risk? And is the risk enough to change bank behaviors? So is the issue on bank radars? Uh, my inquiries tell me it is, and not only in the legal departments, um, also in the fraud and operational risk departments. Um, my current impression is, and I'd love to hear from you all, is that banks are alert to the risk but not losing sleep because it is actually in the corporate world, in the corporate side of things, a relatively rare issue. So two solutions, uh, relationship managers need to be really on the ball. Um, if you're upgrading your anti-fraud system, perhaps you could think about some quince care risk uh, tools. Um, and I think this might, might, might remain the case as long as this remains a corporate banking issue. However, there's a possibility that it might spread, uh, in which case things may change. Well, I think that kind of segues us nicely. If we can leave the corporate, unless you want to say something, Jeffrey. Just wanted to add one further point, which is that <coughs> the Court of Appeal in J.P. Morgan was very concerned to, as it were, raise the issue without providing any answers. Uh, and they have thrown the matter very much into the hands of the trial judge. Uh, the justification being that um, that wonderful phrase, everything is fact specific. Uh, and so it is to be hoped that there is going to be more guidance on precisely what the bank can and should do as a result of the six week trial, which is due to start in, in February next year. But uh, given the amounts of money involved, I'm pretty sure that's gonna go up to the Supreme Court. Yes, indeed. Um, okay, well then, moving away from the kind of corporate um, quince care duties, as it were, to, to the, the personal the retail banking one, um, as first, most recently addressed in the Phillips case, um, what do you think the banks should be concerned about, Geoffrey? Are they, are they losing sleep about this, or, or rather less so, I think? <laughs> They're not losing so much sleep about the quince care decision, is, is, is my impression. Um, not least because Philip has said that essentially it's related to um, accounts with companies or with unincorporated associations and not individuals who give instructions. Uh, it's not wholly beyond the bounds of possibility that Quince Care could be widened um, in the Court of Appeal. And it's also not beyond the bounds of possibility that even as found in Philip, there are cases, there was a recent case in Scotland where uh, a judge refused to strike out a Quince Care claim in circumstances where there had been prior discussions between the client and the bank um, about whether an individual in the fraud department called Steve existed or not. Uh, and the bank apparently wasn't able to give a very clear answer about that. Uh, and the, the, the payment appeared to follow uh, the bank not being able to ask uh, to answer the question who is Steve in the fraud department uh, and so there may be a m more scope if there are discussions between the bank and the customer but the real issue in relation to retail banking is not the position of the quince care duty it's the approach being taken by the financial ombudsman service because there have now been uh, I think it's something like 20 decisions of the financial ombudsman subsequent to the decision in Philip. And of those 20 cases, 17 have been found by the financial ombudsman in favor of the, uh, uh, in favor of the customer. And it's not just that the financial ombudsman is finding in favor of the customer, it's how the financial ombudsman is finding in favor of the customer. The decisions which, and a number of them look as if they are template decisions, are essentially saying, we're not dealing with the quince care duty, we are deciding what is fair and reasonable. Uh, and what is fair and reasonable is going to depend upon, uh, for example, what systems the bank actually has in place. That classic, the more you know, the more you are going to be deemed to know or to be obliged to find out. Um, and secondly, uh, Philip was 
dismissive, I think that's the right word, of the idea that the red flags should have alerted the bank. The financial ombudsman is very keen to note flags, red flags, and the main red flag appears to be uh, a large payment. That appears to be of itself a sufficient red flag for the bank then to be obliged to ask a whole series of questions. And if you look at some of the financial ombudsman's decisions, it's quite an interrogation. There is one where an individual had made an investment some 12 months before, uh, and it was the, the financial ombudsman concluded that given the size of the payment, that the bank should have been effectively saying to the customer, what's the payment for? It's an investment. What's the investment? It's going to be X. What, what are you getting for the investment? The answer actually would have been 43%, 43% 43 uh, return. Um, and the financial ombudsman view, view in that situation was the bank should have continued to ask questions in order to determine precisely, or essentially, the, to, to persuade the customer not to make the payment. And so quince care itself is not the problem, in my view, in the retail sector. The problem in the retail sector is what the financial ombudsman is doing. And essentially speaking, although there's a decision in Hong Kong uh, which describes the quince care duty as uh, something which does not make the bank into a fraud detector, uh, the effect of what the financial ombudsman is doing in the retail sector is converting the bank into a, into a fraud detector. Helen, what's your, what's your thought on that? Um, well, I, I largely agree. I think um, since uh, Quince Care is about the ostensible authority of an agent, it shouldn't apply to personal cases, and I think the current decision in Philip is correct. Um, I do think that there is this cultural expectation developing in this country. That may not extend to other countries. Um, in Hong Kong, we have the case of Luk Wing Yang against CMB Wing Lung Bank. Uh, which held that the duty only arises where misappropriation of customer funds occurred by the actions of an authorised or trusted agent of the customer, rather than when the, when the uh, individual customer herself instructs payment as a result of being tricked or defrauded by a third party. And that was a case where the fraudster was actually uh, a bank employee who was subsequently sentenced to 10 years jail for their fraud. Uh, and this is in a context where um, Hong Kong is a robust jurisdiction in protecting banking customers and their rights, and the HKMA is a robust regulator. So um, I think it's more a sort of a, a cultural attitude. We've yet to see whether the regulators in Hong Kong will follow the um, UK regulators' lead. I've seen um, uh, Quince Care cited by uh, FOS in the resolution of push payment cases. Um, and given the general direction of travel at FOS, I'd agree uh, with Jeffrey that um, a quince care type of result is quite likely in their decisions, regardless of the out ultimate legal outcome in Philip. Okay, um, well, uh, so I mean, w w the Philip decision is going to appeal next year, um, and we'll have to see where, wh where that Kind of what, how that pans out, but but the financial ombudsman is is more of a concern to the banks, do we think, than the quince care in the personal sense? Yes, that, that's certainly my view. <coughs> what the court of appeal will do in Philip is not clear. I think uh, I think Helen is right that if you go back and look at quince care itself, it's concerned. It's said to be concerned with corporates not with personal banking, and as Helen rightly says, it's based upon the authority or the ostensible authority of the individual giving the instructions. And my personal view is that uh, the Court of Appeal will be reluctant to impose uh, more of a duty on the banks, probably because in part the Court of Appeal will regard that as being something that the regulator should deal with rather than the quince care duty because the regulator is more au fait with what should happen. Okay, well I'm sure the bankers in the room and I, I suppose the lawyers acting for them will, will want to know your thoughts I guess on what whether it's going to be possible to exclude the quince care duty and, and as you mentioned Geoffrey that the, the, the JP Morgan the Republic of Nigeria and JP Morgan case grapple with this in some detail. Um, is it going to be possible to exclude the, exclude the duty? 
In a corporate sense, and I guess, in a, in a personal sense? Uh, in a personal sense, no. You will not be able to exclude the Quinn's Care duty if it is held to apply, which at the moment it doesn't. Um, in the corporate sense, uh, to be uh, slightly flip about it, um, good luck trying to exclude it. Uh, the council in the JP Morgan case for the, uh, the claimant accepted that in appropriate circumstances the Quince Care duty could be excluded, uh, but there was then a detailed analysis of a number of clauses which, and I don't think we need to go into the detail of the clauses, but taken as a whole, uh, it looked as if, uh, it, I think it was fair to say, it looked as if the bank was trying to exclude the duty, uh, even though it might have been possible to do it with clearer words. But you have to bear in mind that what the duty is concerned with is a situation where, some, where the bank has been reckless. And so to exclude the duty in that situ situation is going to be very difficult indeed. Uh, you would need clear words. You probably wouldn't get sufficiently clear words in the sort of terms and conditions that you see from banks these days. Um, yes, I mean, you, the wording would need to be very clear and effectively say that banks exclude liability for transferring funds even if they suspect fraud. So um, apart from retail customers, I think this, this wording may not appeal to corporate customers. Um, and from a regulatory perspective, I wonder whether it would also be inconsistent with the duties to treat customers fairly. Um, but actually, I just think it would be a reputational issue for banks. I mean, banks, I think, would dislike this kind of wording as much as their custom customers. It's just, it's just not good wording to have to put in your terms and conditions. So I don't see much of an avenue there. Well, perhaps some bankers in the audience might, might uh, give their views on that when we get to, to our Q&A. Um, finally, uh, before we turn to that kind of Q&A se section, um, on insolvencies, um, we've had a couple of decisions, in particular the, the Stanford decision. Um, do you think the Stanford decision is the last word on this, Jeffrey? I mean, are we going to see more of these uh, issues determined in terms of loss, the recoverability of certain losses? Uh, the Stanford decision is definitely not the last word, uh, and I don't, th well, I would be surprised if the decision in the Supreme Court is the last word. Um, as I indicated um, earlier, the Stanford decision in part turns upon the way that the claimant framed the case in Stanford. What happened in Stanford was that monies were paid out to creditors of the company when the company was, it transpired, trading while insolvent. And the argument that was advanced in Stanford was that in those circumstances there was a loss to the company. And what the Court of Appeal said, in my view, for what that's worth, rightly, that that was confusing the position pre and post insolvency. When the payments were made out by the company, albeit it was trading by uh, when it was insolvent, uh, it made payments to creditors as a result of which its liabilities were reduced. The fact that it couldn't pay all of those liabilities did not mean that the liabilities were, uh, were not reduced. And so the company suffered no loss because the company had its, its liabilities reduced. And the fact that there was then less available for the creditors in insolvency did not give rise to a claim. Now, obviously, from the bank's point of view, that's quite helpful in the sense that they don't have um, a, a, an obligation uh, to prevent a company making payments while it is insolvent on the quince care basis, as long as those payments are genuine. But the problem is that there are different ways of putting that claim. For example, it could be said that irrespective of whether the liabilities had been reduced, there had been some sort of consequential loss suffered as a result of the payments. More significantly, the position may be that the company's asset position was worse when it eventually came to be in insolvency because red flags had not been picked up while the company was trading by insol while insolvent. If those red flags had been picked up and the bank had stopped the payments, that might have then triggered the insolvency and might have saved the company significant amounts of money. Uh, whether the Supreme Court actually addressed those non-pleaded 
sorts of claim. It, it is a matter of speculation. But there certainly, it certainly seems to me that there is scope for liquidators to attack the banks for payments that were made pre-insolvency on the basis that if the payments had been refused, then that would have essentially put the company into insolvency earlier. Yes, I, I think um, uh, it, it would be helpful for banks to keep a weather eye on solvency of clients in, in the Quinscare context. And so Singularis um, and Stanford claims were brought by liquidators. And um, those of you who might were involved in the Marnal Sanea um, al Gasebi fraud will know that the liquidator in, in Singularis uh, fought a very robust campaign. Um, and established the fact that uh, the fact that the company has a sole director who has issued the fraudulent instructions is not a Quinscare defence. So I now expect uh, Quinscare type issues to be um, thought about quite hard by insolvency practitioners uh, when administering an insolvency. Um, although Singularis involved a very large transfer, um, in fact, this may more typically be a risk in smaller uh, one man sole director family company cases. Now, uh, banks are very likely to be very attentive already to client companies that appear to be at risk of insolvency um, and scrutinize transactions uh, quite carefully where uh, those companies owe the banks money. So there may be that higher level of scrutiny already. Um, there may be rare occasions where a transferring bank is not a lending bank and a Quinscare type transaction could sneak through. So I would say keep an eye out in insolvency situations. I mean, I certainly would echo those points, um, Helen, about insolvency practitioners. I'm sure on, if they haven't had it already on their checklist of things to look at upon their appointment, they would be certainly looking at that. And um, banks will know that they are obviously considered to have deep pockets and um, insolvency practitioners will be looking to see what claims can be brought. Uh, with or without, I suppose, litigation funders on board uh, who prepared to bring those claims. Okay, um, we've got, unless you've got anything else, Jeffrey, before we go to the Q&A, do you want to, no? Well, we've got 15 minutes or so for a, uh, hopefully, a lively Q&A debate. I, I don't know whether or how any virtual attendees ask questions, but um, has anyone got anything like they'd like to raise at this point, comment or question? Hmm early tea break or lunch break. Surely those of you who do banking, have a banking practice must have some views on this. Uh, we, we, we had one question come through on, on the Slido app. Um, to a certain extent, I think it's been answered a little bit. But the question is, how does the duty apply to authorised push payment fraud? And does pay verification help banks with this? Well, uh, <coughs> the answer to that is Philip was a push payment fraud uh, conducted, or well, was the frauds being conducted on individuals. And Philip concluded that the, um, the, the, the duty did not apply to an individual, a non-corporate customer. Um, the, uh, the problem of um, payment verification and things like that is that it feeds into the position of the ombudsman, the financial services ombudsman, as opposed to the quince care duty, because it's a classic example of the more, the more you monitor, the more you look, the more you find out, the more you raise red flags, the more you, the financial ombudsman will regard you as having to um, uh, deal, deal with a customer, tell the customer not to make the payment, and even as people might have seen, there was a case um, uh, report referred to in the Sunday Times yesterday, where I think it was um, Santander uh, had tried to persuade a customer that his um, his payment was fraudulent and should not be made, or was a potential sham and should not be made, uh, and the customer was quite firm that uh, it was not a fraudulent payment. So the bank froze his account and would not unfreeze his account uh, until he, for want of a better word, admitted that what he was being asked to do was a sham, and that took two or three months. 
It's extraordinary. I think certainly from our look at some of the financial ombudsman cases, there are some really quite extraordinary examples. But where, in that case, as you say, Jeffrey, the, the uh, he was he was forced, I think, to 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 say that this is what that this is a scam. He had to utter those words, and he was being pressed by the bank. Yes, it was. I admit it's a scam. <laughs> Otherwise, I can't use my account. Yeah. Well, perhaps I could say a couple of words about um, breach of mandate as well, which is also a risk for banks if they don't pay and they've got a, a false positive. Um, and um, this is actually a real risk um, if they pay or, or delay in making a payment. Um, in some parts of the world where there's high incidences of fraud, um, some banks do have a practice of, of calling customers when they see... Um, a large check or something of that nature. Now, technically, I think they, they shouldn't do that. They should pay unless they suspect. Um, but it does seem sensible. Um, but um, this can lead to, um, and I have seen for delay of half a day, an action um, on a breach of mandate. Uh, while, while, while questioning whether a payment was, uh, fraudulent, was fraudulent, was being checked out. So um, you don't see it so much over here. Um, but it is something that remains available. Um, so again, that sort of adds to the um, double jeopardy situation the banks find themselves in. I suppose that depends on the, if we talk about a personal context, is, is there going to be a personal quince care duty imposed or is, is, is Philip's going to be, uh, you know? I like to think Philip would be upheld, but uh, no guarantees on that. But I mean, in, in relation to, I mean, if, if you're in a situation where you're um, advising the bank, the question, the ultimate question, in a corporate context, the ultimate question is going to be, how much did the bank know? Um, and I mean, if you look at the JP Morgan case, the bank had a great deal of knowledge in, admittedly, and this is one of the problems, different parts of the organization. Um, and uh, when I can say, well, it's a big claim, but the, uh, the bank's disclosure uh, in the JP Morgan case cost a little matter of three million pounds. Um, and there was a great deal of disclosure that had to be given, not least because one of the important questions was how far up the chain did the knowledge go? Did the knowledge go far enough up the chain to reach somebody who could actually do something about it? And so there was a great deal of disclosure that had to be given as to the seniority or the, the, those in respect, in re relatively senior positions. With regard to the client, if you're advising a client, in a corporate situation, obviously, the client is going to be, uh, as it were, the one who, or the, d the directors who were not fraudulent. Um, and again, it, the important thing is going to be, all right, was there anything odd about the payment? And what did the bank know? Is there anything that should have put the bank on, no on notice? Now, most of the time, that's not going to be, or may not be, something which is within the knowledge of the client. But the client should know, and you should know, that the bank has all sorts of monitoring procedures. So it would be a question of asking the bank, you know, what monitoring procedures do you have? What, uh, what monitoring procedures do you have in relation to money laundering, in relation to terrorists, uh, in relation to PEP, um, politically exposed persons, um, and also in relation to fraud, in order to try and demonstrate that the bank either did or ought to have known what was going on. Yeah, I think the case to watch is the Nigeria case, if it goes ahead uh, next year, because I think that in that case, the, the court will have to set out some sort of roadmap um, about, you know, what the roughly what the standards are, or at least uh, in applying the test to the facts uh, that, that are established in that case, we should be able to work out what the roadmap is our, ourselves. Whether the banks would like the roadmap or the customers would like the roadmap is to be seen. 
it, it, I, I agree with that, and it's to be hoped that the judge will do that, not least because, as I think I said earlier, um, the Court of Appeal distinctly did not do that um, when dealing with the issues in relation to the, um, uh, the appeal on the question of the exclusion of the duty. Uh, the slight concern that I have is that judges, at least at first instance, are quite often reluctant to lay down general rules and are more concerned to decide the case on the facts in front of them. And it has to be said that the facts in front of them and JP Morgan are really extreme. Well, we'll have to wait with bated breath. I think probably bankers are as well. Um, I've got a question. Uh, yeah, hi there. It's um, Luke Harrison from Keaton Harrison. And a question about receiving bank liability. Um, we've obviously seen um, a development in the, the Queen's Care line of authorities, and I wonder how much overlap there is with the liability of receiving banks and whether we're going to see sort of the, the, the authorities sort of merging to some extent. You think, you're talking specifically about in, in an authorised push payment sense where the, the receiving bank is... I'm talking about the scenario often where there's a, where there's a fraud and money is diverted maybe in, in, in those sorts of scenarios but ends up in a receiving bank where often the account owner has disclosed that they would be operating the account for X purposes and the payment they receive and the dissipation of that payment is out with the disclosed purposes that they, they mm. uh, told the bank about. Um, yes, well, I think um, uh, this is interesting, actually, because it is, it is the, uh, the paying bank that's in the front line. And, of course, um, the receiving bank could be a result of a corporate fraud, so it could fall within the, the Queen's Care context. Um, I think, yes, and, and people are starting to criticise receiving banks, saying, you know, are you doing your KYC? Are you monitoring the accounts? Are the accounts being used in the way you would expect them to be used when they were opened? Now, that's a money laundering situation, um, because it's not a money laundering situation when the payment goes out, but it certainly is when it's received. And so you would expect money laundering um, controls to kick in there. Um, and I think it would be fair to ask receiving banks to um, explain the situation when they're on the receiving end of these payments. Yes, I would agree with that. Um, the receiving bank, given what um, the position is in relation to know your client, and the information that the receiving bank would have about the account, the account holder, etc. The receiving bank is more likely to be subject to claims for dishonest assistance in the fraud that's being conducted by uh, by its customer, uh, and it's the, the paying bank is in a, I suppose the word is a better position to deal with. Um, uh, allegations of dishonest assistance, because th unless the, re the paying bank is the same bank as the uh, the account holder, uh, the account that the money is going to, um, the, the paying bank would not have any knowledge of the account to which the monies were going. Um, I don't see any enthusiasm at the moment, and Helen may have views on this, any enthusiasm on the part of the regulator to go beyond the paying bank in terms of push payment frauds and things like that. But that is something that may well develop. Yes, I'm, I'm not informed on that point myself, so if anybody's got any thoughts, please do chip in. Uh, just one final question that's come through on the on the system. As this seems to be right for global scams, are we likely to see cooperation between banks and regulators? And if so, what issues will arise from this? That's probably for you, Helen. Yeah, there already is cooperation between uh, regulators and between banks and banks and regulators uh, developing. I mean, the the, uh, the advent of open banking helps this. Um, and I, I think that um, ways of opening up those avenues, um, obviously it has to be balanced with banking confidentiality, is happening quite a lot. And I see that, and I see that on the corporate side as well, uh, particularly, and uh, as well as the retail side. Good. Any final questions? One over there. Yeah. Hi, um, Daniel Eisen. I'm in-house at Barclays. So I, I think it's been a, a, a really balanced discussion, actually. Um, very interesting, covering a lot of ground. First of all, I think I'd agree with what Helen said, um, that banks are alert to the risk but not losing sleep. That, that, that's probably a nice way of summarizing it. Um, one of the other comments I was going to make in the corporate scenario where you have a relationship manager, sometimes the issue is it, not about relationship managers taking on their clients. Often the relationship with the client is so long standing and it's one based on trust that if the client 
you know, becomes the fraudster, it's very difficult to spot. So the knowledge can be really difficult in that context. Um, in the FOS um, scenario, I think Jeffrey's right to spot that as the, as the trend area. I guess there'd be a hope that um, a strong Court of Appeal decision in Philip would help shift the narrative a bit there in, t in terms of the FOS requirement to actually have regard to the law. That, that, that is there within their mandate as well. Um, and, and the, la the last point I was going to make actually feeds on the question a moment ago in the receiving bank context, is whether you think that, um, or, or how you think the courts would react to interpleader proceedings in these scenarios, and whether that's a trend area that we might see more of. My answer to that last question is yes, and quite simply. And picking up on one other point you make about um, the relationship manager, I, I've always found the position of a relationship manager um, quite an odd one because your uh, the relationship manager is and will often regard himself as acting in part at least for the client um, and it seems to me one aspect of this is going to be I suppose one would say um, more control oversight of relationship managers and also better documentation from the relationship manager of his contacts with his client um, I think it would be good if receiving banks were uh, a bit more alacritous in their response to these things. I mean, certainly uh, when I was in banking, and we, we would we would work very hard. Um, sometimes you need to get orders to freeze accounts, but you know we'd make clear we're not opposing any orders. We you know please please get an order to freeze the account and and so on and so forth. Um, and um, I think it would be good if people woke woke up to that. And I've seen that internal fraud teams work really really hard to try and uh, uh, do that and and save the money for the customer. Um, but so regulatory backup on that, I think, would be very welcome. Right. Well, I think um, that probably draws us to a close with a minute or so to go. I mean, certainly a really interesting and, and, and very fast-moving uh, area. I think 2022 is going to hopefully reveal quite a lot and, and probably has teased this up nicely for a, for a session on this very same subject this time next year, I guess. Um, I'd like to thank my panel, Jeffrey and, and Helen, and thank you very much for listening. And... Um, well, we'll see you next year.